So, I welcome you all uh, to this course on steel making. Uh, this course, uh, which comprises of nearly 40 lectures, uh, will be delivered by myself, Professor Deepak Majundar and Professor Satish Chand Korea. Uh, both of us are working at IIT Kanpur for a long, long time and specialized in steel making. Uh, and throughout this course, uh, our objective has been uh, to provide adequate knowledge on steel making to you, such that you can appreciate uh, the relevance of the subject in present context, understand its wide knowledge base, and then think that uh, you know how developed the subject is and how difficult it is really to make further improvements. Today, when we talk about steel making, we understand that it is uh, you know more than nearly 150 years old, near perfect technology, uh, enormous casting rates, uh, enormous uh, steel making and primary steel making vessels, and you know highly uh, clean and sophisticated grades of steels. So, we have advanced remarkably and uh, bring further uh, improvements uh, to steel making uh, certainly is not as simple as in many new fields which have emerged in recent years. So, it is therefore necessary that you have adequate knowledge of the subject, uh, you have adequate knowledge of the fundamentals and it is with this adequate knowledge and fundamentals we think that you should be a better you know you will be eventually a better steel maker, a better steel making engineer or a steel making metallurgist as we say and will be able to contribute immensely uh, in the field of steel making. Now, as I have mentioned we will deliver lectures about 40 hours, sometimes you will see me, sometimes you will see professor Korea. We will deliver lectures on diverse topics which will encompass uh, fundamentals uh, which will encompass uh, uh, primary steel making, secondary steel making, casting processes, electric arc furnace steel making, BOF steel making, continuous casting, you name it. And we will be delivering lecture on practically all aspects of steel making. So, this being the first lecture, uh, I will start the discussion with an overview of the subject, uh, which is sort of general. Uh, I intend to give you a historical perspective first and followed by that, uh, will, I will give you an overview, which is a broad sketch of the skilled steel making circuitry and examine in details uh, the issue of energy in steel making. And finally, I will wrap up this uh, you know uh, two lecture section uh, by making certain statements regarding uh, steel the future of steel making, what was yesterday, what is today and what will be tomorrow like for all of us. Now, as you are aware that uh, steel is a very old material and known to mankind for a long, long time. And today, you, you look at any area, you know, be it automotive sector, railway sector, construction sector, everywhere you find steel is there. And what is steel to us as a metallurgist? Steel is a solution of carbon in iron uh, with certain amount of trace elements, maybe sometimes silicon, sometimes other alloying additions like manganese. And occasionally, we have some impurities also present in steel, which we are unable to drive off completely. But from an engineer's point of view, steel is a material which has diverse properties, and these properties uh, which uh, come to our use are mostly we are talking about engineering property and steel has as you know excellent toughness, good tensile strength or strength. It has uh, uh, good strength to weight ratio. Uh, it is uh, basically I would say uh, can withstand thermal uh, high thermal uh, you know environment. Uh, or high temperature environment, uh, it has immense recycling potential. You imagine you have iron, iron ore from the mines and then you make iron and eventually that iron becomes iron ore, it corrodes and it gets back into the soil. So, it has many, many qualities which has made it attractive, but most importantly 
is the wide range of mechanical properties. And this mechanical properties, we have been able to induce into steel by virtue of a proper melting circuit, a proper refining circuitry and finally, by you know a series of mechanical working processes whereby we control the microstructure of steel and induce into steel a variety of properties. Now, steel is made as you all know either from the blast furnace, blast furnace iron making of course, you must have done prior to this particular course. So, molten steel, molten iron which we produce in blast furnace which is known as the peak iron. So, we can have a peak iron based or blast furnace based iron making a steel making process alternatively we can have a DRI based steel making process also. Okay. So, blast furnace based steel, steel making I will write it like this blast furnace based steel making based or pig iron based steel making and then we have DRI which is called direct reduced iron DRI based DRI based steel making basically uh, does not require often do not require uh, molten pig iron. So, it is supplemented with some amount of scrap maybe some sometimes some amount of solid pig iron and pig iron based or liquid pig iron based this I would say better liquid pig iron based because some plants do use solid pig iron charge also and uh, DRI based steel making processes often uses plus scrap plus solid pig iron. So, liquid pig iron based steel making processes essentially are the oxygen steel making processes which we say as basic oxygen steel making process. On the other hand DRI based steel making processes are termed as the electric steel making processes or electric. The furnace in which BOS is carried out is termed as the BOF basic oxygen furnace. The furnace in which electric steel making is carried out is the electric arc furnace as we all know. Once we produce steel which is we call as a crude steel, we have a series of secondary refining operations and following the secondary refining operations today what we have is continuous casting. As you all must be knowing that uh, ingot casting has been phased out of course, in certain specific areas we have uh, in got casting still practice, but very in a minuscule level you know, more than 95 percent of the world still produced today is cast through continuous casting process. Uh, today, a steel plant based on in got casting with BOF steel making is not sustainable at all, because the rate at which the basic oxygen steel making process produces steel, it requires an equally fast process to convert molten steel into solid product. So, ingot casting is a much more slower process, the conversion rate from liquid to solid is much slower in ingot casting than in continuous casting. So, ingot casting is no match for BOS. So, with BOS or BOF we require what is uh, we, we call as continuous casting of steel making. So, with basic oxygen steel making process and ESP or electric steel making process. We have a series of secondary steel making process, we will discuss this and uh, as I said a variety of secondary steel making processes and all the secondary steel making processes are not used to produce a given grade of steel. Uh, they are basically used depending on the requirement of the customer, this will be clear to you in a moment and following that we have continuous casting. Now, what is the history of steel making like? When was steel first made? So, more than 150 years ago and the father of steel making is Sir Henry Bessemer, a British engineer who first in a clay crucible used a clay tube, fire clay tube to blow in air to molten pig iron 
and that is when steel making really started. And since the days of Henry Bessemer, remarkable advances as you all know uh, have been made. So, we first started with the what is the process known as the Bessemer process, we had the Thomas process, we had the open heart process and gradually these processes they were phased out by 1960s or 70s completely. Today, basic Bessemer process of steel making is virtually non-existent, non-existent a Bessemer process of steel making. Similarly, Thomas process of steel making uh, which also in, uh, involves blowing of uh, air through molten pig iron has also been nearly phased out uh, by 1970s. Open heart steel making is remaining in one or two places all over the world and today bulk of the world steel is produced uh, by two different routes which is the basic oxygen furnace and electric arc furnace. Now, the remarkable production of steel has been possible in the last 50 years or 60 years because of the advent of oxygen steel making process. And the first oxygen steel making process which is known as the LD steel making process started about uh, in the era of 1950s, late 1950s in a place called Linge, places called Linge and Donovich simultaneously near Austria. And since then the production of steel really uh, searched quite a bit and it is after the second world war really there is lot of scrap also available and simultaneously how to convert that scrap into a meaningful uh, uh, you know value added product. So, the electric arc furnace also picked up the momentum. Today, if you look at the production of steel, we would say 60 percent of the world's crude steel is produced uh, through the basic oxygen steel making process. On the other hand, uh, about 34 percent of the world's steel is produced uh, the electric arc furnace steel making process. Last year in 2008, for example, how much of steel was produced? Almost 1330 million ton in 2009. Enormous amount of productivity because everywhere we, you know, the whole world is developing. Um, there are countries like India and China where a lot of construction has to take place, um, and we have large population in these countries. So, the global demand for wall or steel uh, has increased remarkably over the uh, years particularly during the last three decades and so on. So, if you look at uh, you know the quantum of steel that we have been able to produce in the last uh, 50, 60 years almost 5 to 6 times uh, more steel are being produced today. So, if you talk of 1950s, 1960s we were producing something like uh, you know say 200 million tons, 200 million tons and today we are at 13, six, almost six fold increase in the last from 200 million tons around 1950-60 to about 13, 30 million in 2009, which essentially tells us that has you know, nearly about a six fold increase, six to seven fold increase in the and that the society needs now more and more steel because development work has to go on people lifestyle has increased and actually if you all know that uh, you know the consumption of steel is an index of the uh, wealthiness of a nation. I mean because uh, you see st steel is used to produce automobile, steel is used to produce refrigerator body, steel is uh, produced uh, used uh, to make fans, air conditioner bodies and so on. So, when, you know high consumption of steel necessarily tells that people have lot of money in their pocket and they are able to buy all these kinds of gadgets for their comfort. So, therefore, a society if it consumes more and more steel, uh, we will certainly see that you know certainly find that yes that society is a very developed society, people have lot of income and they are going to they can spend money in many items uh, the backbone of which essentially is steel and indeed. Uh, you know the consumption of flat products, flat products means as we will see later on uh, steel is produced in the form of say long products, long products is what railways for example, rail lines or rail tracks that you see many plants produce that 
So, we say it is a long product plant, okay. wire and rods which are used in the houses, so, these are all long products. On the other hand, flat products are out of slabs and sheets and ultimately thin sheets are strips are produced by rolling and we say that if a plant produces, uh, you know, you may have seen huge trucks moving on the road with, you know, uh, strips of steel in the form of a coil. So, how are they produced? They are produced from continuously cast slab and then the continuously cast slab is rolled and then you produce thin strips. So, these flat products, if a society consumes more flat products, that means, the society must be building in more automobiles, the society must be making more trains, the society must be making more fridges, more uh, uh, household equipment, washing machines, household equipment and so on. So, the consumption of flat products or steel flats are again an index of the wealthiness of the nation. Okay. So, a remarkable increase has taken place in the arena of steel production and this has been a possible because of you know widespread development application of knowledge on shop floor developments of newer technologies new sensors and all these things have paved the way for enormous production of steel and today uh, if we if we look at the steel making circuitry the way Bessemer made the steel and today the way steel is being made, you know, the number of man, human, you know, hands required to produce part ton of steel, the level of automation, the level of process control, they are remarkably different than what have been practiced, you know, 100 years back or since the time of Bessemer. So, steel making, now, since the days of Bessemer, for example, I have mentioned about Bessemer steel making. Thomas process, then we have open heart process, which face uh, now extinction. Now, this process are op open Bessemer and Thomas processes use air as the oxidizing agent, because in those days there was no means to obtain pure oxygen. Bessemer did recognize that it is not correct to blow air, it is in fact he knew that perhaps it is better to blow oxygen, but in those days there was no source of you know, cheap availability of oxygen was a big issue and there was no commercial processes available. So, he had no option, but to blow in air. Yeah. And today, we know that nobody would, because com oxygen is available. So, using of air as an oxidizing agent is uh, not really desirable. Now, for, if you look at pig iron composition, pig iron composition, the pig iron contains for example, approximately 4.4 weight percentage carbon. It can contain various types of, you know, it will contain some sulfur, it will contain some phosphorus, it will contain some silicon, it will contain some manganese, it may contain other elements and oxygen virtually is 0 weight percentage, less than 1 ppm, because blast furnace is plus one has an extremely reducing uh, environment. Now, the level of sulfur, the level of phosphorus, the level of silicon and manganese, which is there in the pig iron, which flows out of from the blast furnace, depends on the raw materials which are used in the blast furnace and the operating conditions in the blast furnace. For example, you have heard this, that if the blast furnace is operated, blast furnace hot temperature is very, very high. In that case, I would expect that the level of silicon contamination of the pig iron is going to be relatively large. Similarly, if I say that, well, if black blast furnace slag basicity is not optimum, in that case, sulfur level can be very, very relatively large. So, depending on the raw material composition, depending on the blast furnace operating conditions, the level of sulfur, phosphorus, silicon and manganese can vary significantly 
for example, this could be silicon could be of the order of 1 weight percentage, manganese could, could be of the, of the order of 1.5 weight percentage, sulfur could be of the order of uh, you know 0.15 or 0.12 and in blast furnace we have no phosphorus removal, so the phosphorus could be about 1, 1, 1.5 and so on. Now, we will talk about crude steel. In this crude steel, which flows out of primary steel making, we can have you know carbon less than 0.1 percentage. We can have lot of oxygen now, because it is an oxygen steel making process and so the level of oxygen contamination could be as high as 400, 600, 800 depending on again the process. If you are pumping in too much of an oxygen, note that the solubility of oxygen in molten piece iron at 1600 degree centigrade is about 0.2 weight percentage, which means about 2000 ppm of oxygen can go really inside steel, but it does not happen so. So, this level of contamination can be 400, 600 and, and the operator can control it. So, we can have say 400 to 600 ppm oxygen and as I said, this is no sacrosanct value. This will depend on your uh, the operating conditions. Now, sulfur and phosphorus can be get down you know 0 0.02 in the primary steel making process in the phosphorus also you can get down to 0 0.08. Silicon can be 0.1 weight percentage. If you take secondary steel making, it is possible to reduce oxygen level. You can have nitrogen also, and nitrogen could be 40 to 80 ppm. But from the nitrogen comes, nitrogen is absorbed during capping operation. So, when you empty the furnace, the molten steel comes from the furnace and falls into the ladle, it interacts with the ambient atmosphere and thereby oxygen passes, uh, nitrogen passes into. Sometimes, if you have moisture in the environment or if your raw materials are hygroscopic, you can have some hydrogen pickup also and the level of hydrogen could be 2 to 5 pm depending on the plant conditions. So, to remove as you see phosphorus, silicon, manganese, carbon, the removal of this, we will study this in detail and the principles of steel making they have higher affinity towards oxygen. We will also in the Ellingham diagram that I will discuss when I talk about the science base of steel making under the section of thermodynamics, we will see these are the elements carbon, phosphorus, silicon, manganese, they have great affinity for oxygen and that is why when you pump in molten, pump through molten pig iron oxygen, what happens is that this element reacts with oxygen and gets oxidized. So, steel making basically is an oxidizing refining process, you introduce oxygen and thereby you refine the impurities which are present in or elements which are present in the pig iron itself. Now, if you introduce oxygen for example, sorry air for example, you can understand that this air is going to have nitrogen in it 73 percent, uh, 79 percent nitrogen, 21 percent oxygen. So, therefore, the contamination of steam produced with nitrogen is going to be very, very large. Also, we must know that while blast furnace iron making depends on a fuel, because we have to meet the thermal requirements of many endothermic reactions, which takes place in the blast furnace. You know, the oxide reduction reactions are all endothermic reactions. So, where from the heat is going to come? The heat comes through combustion of coke into carbon monoxide and that melts uh, you know, reduces iron ore and helps to melt uh, solid pig iron, uh, you know, or sponge iron in the um, liquid state, or bring it into the liquid state. So we have in the blast furnace external heat source, which is or the burning of the fossil fuel, which provides the necessary heat. On the other hand, in steel steel making, we do not require any external heat source. Steel making is an autogenous process, which means, you know, the oxidation itself produces so much of heat that it is you know enough to bring steel at a temperature 
of about required temperature 1580, 1590 or around 1600 degree centigrade. So, a threshold amount of carbon, a threshold amount of silicon is necessary to produce that desired level of heat, because in the steel making reactor also, we have to supply heat for many job. For example, lime dissolution, slack formation, okay, these will necessarily require heat, where from the heat is going to come. The pig iron, what kind of a temperature it is tapped? It is, it is, it is taken out of the blast furnace, maybe about 1300 degree centigrade. Again, this may vary 1350 or so. On the other hand, we have steel making at 1600 degree centigrade. So, after we have supplied heat for all endothermic processes, the end, for entire mass, we are going to take jack up the temperature by 1600 degree centigrade. So, therefore, it is understood that if it is an autogenous process, if the heat liberated in steel making is because of the oxidation of carbon, because of the oxidation of silicon, because of the oxidation of phosphorus and manganese, we have to have some critical amount of this elements present in the pig iron. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to bring it to 1600 degree centigrade. Often in steel making, we will see that the level of contamination is such that the temperature gets even more than 1600 degree centigrade. And that is why, when such a scenario say, you know, we experience, we add coolant into steel, which is nothing but the plant generated solid scrap. And that solid scrap, when you put into the steel making reactor, the temperature goes down. So, coolants are normally used. But what is important for us to know is that steel is an autogenous process. Now, when you use air, you are pumping in more amount of air because the air contains you require some threshold amount of oxygen to get into that, to get that much oxygen pumped into molten metal, molten steel. Okay, you have to pump in more amount of air because air contains only 21 percentage of oxygen. So, therefore, it is understood that more volume of air is going to be introduced more volume of air, if it is introduced, that means more heat is going to be consumed by the cold air. And then you are introducing more amount of nitrogen because of that. And this nitrogen is without doing anything going out of the steel converter, therefore, it is going to take away heat. So, the material, so in the Bessemer steel making process, because of this, you know, thermal requirements, you know, you require a, a critical amount of phosphorus, a critical amount of silicon, such that this critical amount of silicon and phosphorus may offset uh, the requirement uh, or may fulfill the, I would say fulfill uh, the thermal requirement of the process. Otherwise, if you do not have a critical amount of phosphorus and silicon in that case, so much of heat is going to be lost because of high volume of air injected that the steel may not be at the desirable temperature. And that is why, you know, even though people knew that uh, air is not a good oxidizing agent, okay. you cannot produce dead soft steel or a very low level of carbon in the steel with air. So, therefore, uh, you know there is all, always steel makers always wanted in the beginning to produce or to make steel through an oxygen steel making route, which was not possible since uh, late 1950s, when uh, the LD steel making process was encountered. Open heart process, this is a pneumatic steel making processes. Okay. Now, steel making processes as you all know can be classified into acid steel making process and basic steel making process. In acid steel making process, for example, the slag is acidic. That means, acidic means the basicity is less than 1. You know already the definition of basicity. So, basicity is less than 1. So, the pig iron having more silicon and therefore, you know less phosphorus and you can, because removal of phosphorus as we will see will require high basic slag. Removal of silicon may not require basic, you know, if phosphorus is not there, you can make silica, oxidize silicon to silicon dioxide, fix it with iron oxide, produce a ferrous silicate slag and that we will be calling as acid steel making process. Acid steel making process, the converter lining is going to be acidic also, because if you have slag as acidic, in that case, if the lining is basic, then the slag is going to eat up that lining and the vessel will require frequent free line, which is not desirable. So, in the case of basic steel making process, basic steel making process is going to be used when charge contains more phosphorus and less silicon, particularly in the context of basic steel making, uh, basic Bessemer process. So, in basic steel making processes, you have 
slack basicity more than 1. So, you can afford to have the lining of the reactor also as basic. If you make the lining acidic, then the slag is again going to eat up the. Today, is it steel making process? Nobody practices. The steel making processes are all basic, whether it is electric arc furnace steel making process, ESP, or whether it is VOS, it is always basic oxygen steel making process because by making a slag with high basicity more than 2, 2.5, 2.8, etcetera, it is possible to simultaneously eliminate both phosphorus and silicon when we particularly inject oxygen to the system. So, coming back to the history of the steel making. So, air has problem, acid steel making was not practiced, acid steel making process which is Bessemer steel making basically phased out, the basic Bessemer process uh, you know has also been phased out now and the open hearth process is not a pneumatic process. So, these are in the bottom blown converters. So, through the bottom of the converter we you know in a vessel converter is nothing but a pear shaped vessel in which steel is made. So, we have set of two years through which air was introduced. So, these are pneumatic steel making processes. So, the air in, you have a molten metal here and as the air is introduced then there is going to be complex convection current here and this you know, expedites the rate of uh, reaction uh, which are essential of the steel making process itself. Open earth steel making process on the other hand as the name suggests the hearth you have a big hearth, wide hearth and that hearth is open. It is uh, basically there is no oxygen injection in the, in, the, in the original version of open hearth furnace. Then how is the pig iron going to be oxidized? The pig iron is going to be oxidized in the open hearth process. The oxidizing agent is the iron ore. There is very little agitation in the open hearth furnace okay? and as a result of which what happens? The rate of the reaction steel making reaction carbon plus oxygen, sulfur plus uh, calcium oxide, phosphorus plus oxygen, silicon plus oxygen all these reactions as we will see later on when we talk about the fundamentals, these are mass transport controlled processes, they depend on the level of agitation. So, in the open hearth process because we do not have much agitation, because we have no oxygen pumping through the open hearth furnace, we have oxygen is supplied from the iron ore and that oxygen which is present in the iron ore will react with phosphorus with silicon, then become phosphorus pentoxide, silicon dioxide and then they will react with lime in the slag and form calcium silicate, calcium phosphate and so on. But that the level of agitation in the open hearth process is small, the rate of steel production is extremely weak. Okay? So, relatively slow rate of open hearth process uh, has, has is, is responsible for its, you know, uh, losing of popularity and therefore, later versions of open heart processes involve some kind of an oxygen lancing also, but today certainly with oxygen steel making processes we are better off. So, we really do not have to consider all these things. Okay. So, these processes have certain many demerits with regard to the present day steel making technology which is oxygen based and as we will see as I discuss and give you an overview of the oxygen steel making you will be able to understand that you know how does these processes compare vis a vis and the productivity and the wide range of uh, quality that are today possible through oxygen steel making processes. Now, let me give you an overview of the modern. So, this is overview of the modern steel making process. I think if you are interested to know about the subjects of you know there is in more greater detail, there are textbooks available where you can refer to, but in the present context perhaps beyond this it is not uh, important for us uh, to go beyond you know, this depth. Now, when you talk of modern steel making process, we are talking of the era of oxygen steel making. That means, we are talking of the post 1950 years and we are talking of steel making that is mostly the oxygen steel making processes. Now, as I have mentioned today, we have 60 percent of steel through 
basic oxygen furnace and 34 percentage of steel to electric arc furnace. And I do not write basic arc furnace, because steel making today per se is basic steel making. So, you have a line switch slack which is there. Now, remaining 6 percentage what is there, this could be mini you know industries like induction furnaces, open heart furnaces, a few of them which are available. So, they you know rest other processes induction, open heart etcetera uh, fill in the gap and make it 100 percent. So, we have primary steel making, from the steel making today we divide it into three different categories. We will say we have primary steel making, we have secondary steel making. I myself do not like the name of secondary steel making as if it is secondary, it is not so important, but as I will you know we will see in this course that secondary steel making today is the heart of steel making. It is here that the finest quality of steel is going to be produced. It is here we are going to ensure you know that what kind of a future product steel certified steel product we are going to deliver to the customer. So, this is per se the most important part of the modern day steel mill. So, I do not wish to say secondary steel making, although this terminology is very common in industry. So, I will call it as a level metallurgy steel making, that will be my terminology level metallurgy steel making. And finally, we will say casting and when you talk about casting, we talk about primarily continuous casting. So, this is basically the components of the modern day steel making circuitry and when you talk of primary steel making, we have two two dominant roots of primary steel making. So, this is number one, which is 60 percent BOF and 30 percent BF. So, let me now schematically draw this. So, we have this is the basic oxygen furnace and this is a schematic representation of an LD converter. We have a top lance here. Similarly, we have a schematic representation of an EAF, we show that well we have three different electrodes here. And this is an EAF process. So, we can produce steel through this and then common to this primary steel making process is our secondary steel making and this is what is known as we have finally subsequently so, this is number 1, what I have shown here is primary steel making, this is secondary steel making or the little metallurgy steel making. So, we have here transfer operations. We have a variety of secondary steel making or little metallurgy steel making process, maybe I can show that well, we have a process, if it is necessary for the grade of steel to be produced, then we can have we have here slide gates. This is an 
R H de Gasser. We will study this later on. The purpose of this is to eliminate and then we can keep on eliminate gases and we can still have R 1 plus R. A variety of processes we will discuss. Following this, we have, so this is the vessel which is the ladle. So, material will be transferred from the BOF to the ladle or from the EAF to the ladle and then a series of and then we have So, this is level, this is Sandish and this is continuous casting. These are slide gates which controls the flow. So, from the level the material gets transferred into Tandish, from the Tandish it gets transferred into continuous casting. And this is the slab which is being produced continuously cast slab. And subsequent to this, so this is the third stage which is the continuous casting. And again, you see between the second and the third stage, what we have? We have transfer operations, transfer operations. So, steel making per se, we can say it comprises of a variety of processing operations, we are processing, okay? we are doing chemical treatments as well as transfer operations. And as we will see in this course, to ensure correct quality of steel, it is important that we have adequate understanding of the processing operation as well as the transfer operation. We cannot ignore the transfer operations, do not ever think that the transfer operations are not important they are equally important uh, in order to ensure. And then comes the final stages, which are the mechanical working process. So, we have you know rolling mills, we have we have the mechanical work and we can have Continuously cast slabs can be put into reheat furnaces, can be put into soaking pits, can be rolled, can be galvanized. We can we have say final finishing operation. So, this is the overall broad view. And this is one two. Now, let me give you some idea about, of course, we are going to deal about basic oxygen steel making processes. So, BOF, EAF, level metallurgy, and continuous casting. Let me explain this circuitry uh, during the next one hour or so, so that you get a nice overview of the subject of modern steel making. So, what constitutes feed to the BOF? So, we have a, so this is a pear shaped vessel. and it is refractory lined and as I mentioned to you that the refractory has to be basic 
because the slag that is going to form here is going to be basic. We want to remove both phosphorus and silicon in the process. So, therefore, the lining is basic. This is a steel shell. The vessel can be rotated like this, okay. while we want to tap it. There is a tap hole somewhere located here. We will do the details of this construction later on also. What constitutes the feed of this the feed here? Mostly liquid pig iron, scrap, then we have So, you have a water cooled lance here. This lance basically is a vertical tube, and on that vertical tube, we have attachments which deliver molten metal or uh, uh, oxygen to molten metal in certain fashion. So, typically, we have a six hole lance. You will see, study the lance design later on. for better interaction of oxygen and liquid bulk, because we want oxygen is there in the gas phase, the oxygen has to dissolve in molten metal and there only in the molten metal it can see the carbon which stays in the dissolved form, it can see the silicon, it can see the phosphorus and interact with them. So, the dissolution and this reactions are essentially important for the production of heat, because more is the carbon oxygen reaction, more is the phosphorus oxygen reaction more is going to be the heat evaluation. So, therefore, the rapidity with which the slag is going to be formed will depend on how much of heat is going to be available and this will directly be related to the dissolution of oxygen in the process. A multi hole lens distributes oxygen and ensures that oxygen transfer from the gas phase to the molten metal is highly efficient. So, we have a cavity depression, this is as I will discuss in the next uh, section is an impinging gas jet. The gas jet is impinging on the surface and the oxygen is introduced in a supersonic speed. That means, the Mach number is greater than 1. So, once you introduce oxygen at a supersonic speed, tremendous amount of what happens, you can imagine you may take a for example, uh, a bucket full of water and then you try to use a blower on the surface of it, you will see there is going to be a lot of droplets of water which are going to be ejected. And when you are injecting at a supersonic speed, you can imagine that you will create an enormous number of metal droplets suspended in the system. So, you create here a mixture of gas slag and metal droplets and you increase the surface area and as I have mentioned and you will also know in greater details that steel making reactions are mostly mass transport controlled, heterogeneous chemical reactions, mass transport control. So, they, they depend on the interfacial area. So, finer the droplets of metal is created, because where is the carbon sitting, where is the sulphur sitting, where is the phosphorus sitting, they are all in the metal. So, if you can create larger surface area, you will have a better possibility of the chemical to expedite the chemical reaction. So, therefore, you know when you inject oxygen at a supersonic speed, you create a large number of droplets and that droplets you know, produces larger surface area. So, the decarburization, dephosphorization rates are very, very high. As a result of this, we can now imagine that the rate of steel making in such vessel is going to be extremely large. Okay. Carbon has good affinity for oxygen, so carbon oxygen reaction will be expedited and we can have uh, steel making, you know, uh, a huge tonnage of steel uh, can be produced uh, within you know 30 minutes to 1 hour duration. What is the average kind of a decarburization rate we are talking about? We are talking about you know, mass of the order of uh, tens kg of carbon uh, per second, that is the rate of uh, decarburization we are talking about. Now, these vessels can be of different sizes depending on the size of the plant. In some cases, you can find 130 ton vessel, but today there are plants which are 500 ton vessel uses 500 ton only converter. Now, it is a highly expensive vessel, the relining, you know, the bricks, fire bricks that we use here, basic bricks 
they are highly expensive. So, we would like to you know take this vessel not for frequent lining. We would, once we line the vessel, our objective would be to use as many blows as possible. So, therefore, we want a very good or prolonged lining life. And therefore, today what happens is the economics of steel making is such a demands that we should consider only decarburization in primary steel making vessel. Forget about other adjustments like uh, desiliconization or uh, uh, silicon of course, will get removed dephosphorization and desulphurization to a significant extent. Carbon will be eliminated, phosphorus channels will be eliminated, but we will not bother too much about the level of oxygen or level of sulfur we can remove there. So, our major thrust in today's primary steel making vessel is to eliminate decarburization. As soon as the carbon is eliminated, we say that well, now we take the steel, we bring it to these processes, level metallurgy steel making, and there we adjust other composition, phosphorus, sulfur, etcetera, and so on. Now, to expedite the rate of reactions here, further we have combination blown steel making processes also, which is a version of the oxygen steel making process. In many steel plants, they use the combination blown steel making process. This does not mean that we use oxygen from the bottom. We use argon, a small amount of argon is used and that argon produces, you know, adequate amount of stirring which expedites the process. We have also processes which are called bottom blown oxygen steel making processes or cube up process, okay, where we do not have a lens but we inject oxygen from the bottom itself. And there, what we do? We use a coaxial tuers. Through one, we have two tuers, you know, two cylindrical, uh, cylinder shaped uh, hollow cylinders, which are used as tuers. So, you have an inner cylinder and then an outer cylinder. Through the inner cylinder, oxygen is produced, oxygen is introduced. Through the outer cylinder, hydrocarbon is introduced. Oxygen produces, if oxygen is introduced through the tuer, in that case, enormous amount of heat is going to be produced here because of the oxidation reaction, and as a result of which the life of the tuer can be significantly reduced. So, hydrocarbon serves as a coolant. How? Hydrocarbon crack, and the crack cracking is an endothermic reaction. So, if you introduce hydrocarbon, of course, injection of hydrocarbon contaminates the bath with carbon. This is true, but to prolong the life, tuer life, because if the tuer life is less, in that case, the fine furnace will need frequent lining, relining and that will you know jeopardize our principal objective of using this converter for. For how many hits? Today 20,000 to 30,000 hits. Twenty thousand to thirty thousand hits each converter can sustain okay, in progressive modern steel plants. So if you are talking of 30 hits a day. Okay. In that case, you can imagine that for 1000 days, the converter can last and 1000 days roughly means that you will require a converter to be relined only after 3 years of time. Once you reline line it, for 3 years you have to forget about it. There are the techniques like today, plaque splashing techniques uh, to prolong the uh, further the life of the lining of the converter. So, coming back to the bottom blown oxygen process. So, we have hydrocarbon injection that hydrocarbon cracks and produces locally endothermic reaction and that endothermic reaction actually protects the two years. So, we have various versions of the steel making processes mostly LD and combination blown steel making processes are being used and these are very fast processes and the main task here is to decarburize the bath. And once we decarburize the bath, we say that steel is made, and we must understand that along with steel, as we refine the steel, we produce also lot of slag here, which has high percentage of iron oxide. It is a highly oxidizing slag because when you oxidize carbon, when you oxidize silicon, when you oxidize phosphorus, because iron is abundant, some amount of iron also oxidizes and whatever oxidizes goes to the slag stage that we all know. So, slag is basically, slag is basically comprised of various oxides. We have added calcium oxide to fix silica, phosphorus, etcetera, the basic slag. 
So, silica, phosphorus, silica, silicon dioxide, phosphorus pentoxide, manganese oxide, calcium oxide, APO, they all comprise, constitute uh, the steel making slag, which has a very high oxidizing power. And when it taps, so after steel making, you know, blowing, we have a, we, we initially introduce oxygen and then after some time, we take samples to find out that how much of carbon is there, how much of, and then control the end blow period, okay, based on that sample analysis. We have also sub lands and through this sub lands, the sub lands is immersed into molten metal and sub lands sample is collected and we know that how much of heat we have been, uh, how much of heat is there and what is the level of carbon content, carbon content, carbon present and based on that we adjust our final stage of blow, blow or fine tune the final stages of blow, introduce the requisite amount of oxygen and then get the final composition of the melt in terms of, primarily in terms of carbon. And once that is done, we empty the vessel and where we empty the vessel, we have a transfer operations here, we tilt the vessel and we pour it in a layer way. As we tilt the vessel, we must ensure that the slag does not get into the level, but we will require some amount of slag here to serve as a protective cover. So, we will freshly make a slag, we will not want any oxidizing slag, which is a carryover slag and carryover slag is a very detrimental as we will see as we advance in the course. Now, following we tap, as we tap, finish tapping, then the furnace is made vertical again, the operator inspects if there are any cracks or the lining needs repair or not. You know, at that particular point, we can have slag splashing also and after that, you know, the preparation for the second heat and blowing starts. For the, for the preparation of blowing uh, is done, uh, next blowing is done for the subsequent uh, heats. Now, following that, we will have, this is, you know, you will know much more details about the oxygen steel making process, you know, about the details, but this much background is good enough for, you know, as, as far as this overview is concerned. And we can also have electric arc furnace to which we are going to produce steel. So, the material which comes out of here, which goes into the level, now carbon is right, oxygen is not right, sulphur may not be also right, phosphorus may be okay, carbon is okay. So, it will require further amount of treatment, because we have to get oxygen right, we have to get sulphur right, maybe nitrogen is also not right, because in the transfer operation nitrogen has to be stuck. So, the steel which has come out is not the final steel that we want, it is a crude steel, it will require a variety of refining processes. Some gaseous species have to be removed, uh, some further refining has to be done, oxygen has to be removed and so on. So, a variety of level metallurgy processes would be necessary. Now, I am going to, to talk about the electric furnace steel making and we will also see that, you know, what is the essence of an electric 